Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Major thank you to Flip and to all of the media partners here and to the amazing City of Seoul for hosting us. This is my second time here in South Korea and I am so thankful to be here again and to introduce my business partner, Ryan Kirkley. Very happy to be here and excited to talk today about uh, tokenization of real world assets and bringing uh, the TradFi ecosystem into the digital economy. So we've had an amazing two days here of conversations and interviews and keynotes and discussions about tokenization and about securities specifically, equities, real estate, debt products, the real foundations of capital markets. So I don't necessarily need to be here to explain how all this stuff works because you've heard it from some of the most amazing thought leaders in the industry over the last couple of days. So to close out an amazing conference, Ryan and I just had a good idea of discussing some of the trends we see in the market, what's going on in the space, and, and keep this one light and high energy as we close out an amazing conference. So with that, Ryan, maybe if you want to kick us off with your background, a little bit about who you are, and uh, just to set the table here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so my background in crypto has started in 2013 uh, with Bitcoin and coding and getting really kind of in the weeds of development. I uh, had a machine learning background as well. Uh, over the years, I've dabbled everything from Ethereum all the way over to the ICO boom, to NFTs, but really kind of always found myself drawn to the institutional, institutional applications of blockchain. Uh, over that time, I ended up starting a venture studio. We've launched over seven projects in the space, and that's led to an accelerator, which is how Kyle and I met, and then that led to me being managing partner at Cointelegraph Ventures, where I sat and looked at probably 1,000 plus real world asset decks. And over and over and over again, I saw a consistent theme of everyone is tokenizing individual assets. There's very little cross-chain liquidity. And more importantly, there's a liquidity gap. So you have an amazing background and an awesome expertise, especially in US venture capital, which for so many people around the world is the holy grail of how to build technology that's expensive and also to acquire licensure that is also very expensive. And as it turns out, unless you want to fund it yourself, you're going to need to find investors to make that happen. So I want to dive into later in this conversation just some of your perspectives on the RWA security token market and the industry as a whole. But before we do that, maybe I'll give a quick background on myself if that's Absolutely. okay. Absolutely. So my name is Kyle Sondland. As I said before, Previously, I was CEO of a company called Security Token Market, stomarket.com, if you've seen it before. I've been in this industry for quite some time, and I'm very passionate about the opportunities of bringing tokenization into these markets. My background started in 2013, investing in the digital asset cryptocurrency space, but I became very frustrated with the fact that so much of this technology was, in my opinion, being wasted on assets that didn't actually own anything, didn't have a real impact on our financial system, didn't translate into the multi-hundred trillion dollar market that is stocks and real estate and debt. And so back in 2017, 2018, me and my business partner, Herwig Konings, started a company, Security Token Market, tracking this market as well as building media that we have uh, covered and interviewed so many of the amazing people that have spoken at this conference over the last couple of days. So um, I'm the host of, of a, a podcast in the industry called The Security Token Show, and Ryan and I now are working on an amazing blockchain to build the solutions from a technological perspective to solve some of these real problems in the security token and in the real world asset space, which obviously comprises of not just securities like investments, but also currencies, which is a huge market and an incredibly liquid one at that, as well as commodities and real estate, which may or may not be a security depending on how you structure it and where you are. So I certainly have a, a lot of expertise in this industry and, uh, and I think it's going to be a fun conversation. So with that, Ryan, I want to kick it back over to you. Could you talk a little bit about, you know, from your perspective, what is an attractive investment? What, what is an, a VC looking for 
in a security token project for somebody that, that may be looking to, to work in this space? So uh, I'll say something I don't think will be controversial to any of the projects that have been up here on stage. I don't think VCs are looking at security tokens. I, I think writ large, this space has been pushed to the side of crypto for a very long time. I think there's been a gap between the institutional investors, the regulations, and the ability to make quick money. Uh, the difference between crypto and security tokens is crypto expects 100x in 12 months, and security tokens offer a consistent 10, 10 to 20% return per annum. And so I think that's always been the big challenge here is to show how you can scale revenue, growth, and push to a bigger number. Now that being said is we're seeing some non-typical crypto investors entering the space. Uh, people from Franklin Templeton to Fidelity to BlackRock, they've thrown hundreds of millions of dollars into this ecosystem and we're seeing kind of that bridge of new, new assets coming in to invest in security tokens and just in general tokenized real world assets. And so that's pretty exciting to see. Yeah, so it seems like there's a much more enterprise or B2B style of go-to-market strategy here for the security token space just because there is a little bit less of that retail consumer activity, which I feel like we could go down a whole rabbit hole of whether or not retail even is fully involved in this space or if they, they necessarily want to. Do you have a perspective on, on retail versus institutional access? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll say this and it, it's nothing new. When you look at stats from Robinhood to anything like that, people will individually spot trade. People will access trades on GameStop, AMC with reckless abandon. But what you don't see is them going after ETFs with regularity. Sure, their 401k, sure, their financial advisor may direct them in these kind of things. But for the most part, we invest in what we see on the news. We invest in what we look at and talk to our friends about. We're not investing in things that we can't see, feel, touch, or read about on a regular basis. And so I, I do think that maybe to our own disadvantage in this industry, we've spent a lot of time chasing crowd funds and crowdsourcing of these security tokens as if that's the end-all be-all. The reality is a security token is a much better solution for most assets from a banking, institutional perspective, and asset manager perspective. And I think we finally are seeing the tides turn where you can go to investor conferences and be talking in great length about them. Yeah, I, I think that's a really fascinating perspective. And, and I fortunately have had some firsthand experience working in the, the crowdfunding space with security token market we did launch a Reg CF inside of the US, a tokenized offering for a, uh, a safe note, which is essentially a convertible note into equity into the business. So I did see firsthand how that process looks. And it, it's certainly burdensome. It, it's expensive. It's, it, it can be hard to do these things. And it did start to, to make me wonder around you know, some of the retail adoption statistics. Because when we've sat down and spoken with banks and institutions, they get it immediately because they have scale of their capital. So some of those small little benefits to an individual or one small issuer can really be magnified on a significant scale when you have so much capital. Part of the difficult part, especially on the secondary markets, which is a flashy idea of, oh, we could be trading early stage startups. We could be trading some of these you know, interesting assets. There is a incredible potential there, but one of the problems in that space is that when you have retail, these early stage people, if they're gonna be buying into a project, they wanna be holding for the long term. They don't necessarily want to be selling. If I'm buying a real estate property that's going to get me eight or nine or 10% on my dollar, I may not want to sell it right away. I'm buying it in order to get that dividend. So it does kind of create a little bit of a friction between the, the, the needs and wants there of the investors. I would even add to that, I think we, we suffer in this space from the same thing that, for example, Berkshire Hathaway stock suffers from. People want to own at least one unit of whatever they invest in. It's really hard when you're investing in a class A real estate project. When you're an individual investor, you're never going to see it. You're never going to actually see the returns. You're never going to be able to go into your account and see, oh, I own 25%. And so I think we, we need to figure out how we remarket this if we do, in, in fact, choose as an industry to keep going after these crowdfunding sources because Candidly, it, it has not drawn the appeal of the masses. But it does make a lot of sense because 
there is a disconnect somewhere because I do know like in the US, we see GoFundMe is pretty successful. Kickstarter has been very successful in the past and those types of investors don't actually get exposure to the underlying company. So there, well, there does seem I, to be a potential pathway in the future. I, w I would challenge that a bit in that you look at Kickstarter, which I think is everyone's number one example. The most popular Kickstarters have been board games, card games, drones, things that actually have a deliverable. I know I've, been, I've bought early into companies at two, $300 for a product that maybe only cost 20, knowing I was gonna get early access. Mm. And so I, I think that's the other side of this is that, you know, and maybe we don't need it, is a single CPA, a single financial advisor has 2,000, 3,000 clients. We don't need to convince the 3,000 clients, we need to convince that one person that controls 3,000 clients investment strategy. So, okay, so if, if retail is this exciting opportunity, but one we're still trying to kind of unpack how it works, what do you see is the real enterprise opportunity here? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think it's simple. You look at BlackRock, they put in over $2 billion into the space. You look at JP Morgan with JPM coin. You look at uh, HSBC launching treasuries, all the way over to just massive amounts of uh, individual projects streaming in from everything from commodity exchanges over to governments. I think the world is tokenizing, there's no doubt about that, and now it's about capturing the liquidity, the actual volume of transactions. I know you've had a lot of experience talking to banks, and I mean, I would be curious to hear your perspective on this, you know, what are banks looking at? What are they, what are they excited about? Yeah, so the, the interesting thing is settlement, and I think that this is a, a concept that certainly has been hashed over a, a few times in terms of, not only the costs of rectifying and, and of accounting for the transaction of assets and of money from one place to another, but there's also a, a concept called turnover. And this is how quickly can those resources be reused into a new transaction. And this is a pretty interesting concept. We've seen different companies that do overnight settlements between banks with liquidity. So you've got a lot of banks that they have their assets and they have their liabilities. And on any given day, one bank may be short some little bit of money and they get an overnight loan from a, a different financial institution to cover those liabilities. They pay a little interest rate, the money's back in the morning and everybody's happy. And this happens quite often in the banking sector. And this is something that you can actually make your money work for you way more efficiently when this process gets settled quicker. An example is Broadridge. This is a company that, that has quoted significant cost savings by using tokenization in settling those dollars from bank to bank, so much so that they not only save money in doing each one of those transactions, they actually also unlocked a whole new business vertical for themselves, which was same day lending as opposed to overnight. So instead of having to require them to use their capital one time for overnight, and then waiting until the next morning to get that capital back, they now can actually do multiple transactions with multiple different counterparties and banks in the same day. So not only are they saving on that individual transaction, they're now doing three, four, five different transactions of that type in the same time that they would really only be able to do one. So we're talking about significantly increased liquidity across the board for our most precious financial institutions. These are the regional banks, these are the credit unions, these are the institutions that provide just traditional savings and banking services for clients all around the world, small individual people, and these are our most vulnerable and most important financial institutions that can use tokenization to more efficiently settle those assets. Absolutely, and I think when we start talking about real world impact and retail impact, not only does this help balance sheets for banks, help make all of this much simpler, I think everyone in this room can probably attest to the difficulties of SWIFT, the difficulties of transferring money internationally, of you know how do we end up sending money abroad? How do we get money abroad? How do we settle a credit card transaction where it doesn't take 24 to 48 hours with clawbacks? And as banks onboard into this ecosystem, we'll start to see the real world effects play out for everybody. And that's super exciting to see because the blockchain and security token revolution should happen almost silently. It should happen in the background where the average person never sees that this has changed, but one day all of a sudden, their money is theirs. It's always theirs. It can be instantly transferable. And there's a full AML KYC basis in that regulatory environment happening on chain in the background. So Ryan, I'm really excited to talk about Paxum, which is the layer one blockchain that we've been building. But before we dive into that, I think there's one other interesting question that 
always generally pops up in the security token space or the crypto space when referring to RWAs. And I wanted to hear your perspective on it. Do you think security tokens kill crypto? Or like, what's the relationship between security tokens and RWAs as well as crypto? Can they coexist? How does that, how does that all tie together? Yeah, so I, I have a probably hot take on this and that I think security tokens were bred out of necessity from the regulatory environment, but were never the right solution for regulators or for the industry. Uh, this is something where we've tried to fit a you know, square peg in a round hole. It is not, not the best for us as people trying to issue commodities, uh, commodities or tokenized funds, et cetera. It's not even best for regulators. That's why we've seen Wells Notice after Wells Notice in the SEC. In Korea, we see this still being a very regulated industry that's hard to get into and hard to issue assets. And so I think ultimately, as we evolve and grow, we need to build technical solutions that specifically try to break free of what has become the word security token and instead ten, ten, trend towards how do we provide lending into assets? How do we collateralize assets? How do we push, push these regulatory walls we have up into technically compliant manners? Right, so a lot of that is building those guardrails and accepting the fact that crypto just may be one type of asset class within a broader economy. Correct. I think one of the unfortunate things that happened in blockchain writ large is that the only adoption we had was cryptocurrency. Uh, mm -hmm. It's made it where blockchain for banking, blockchain for securities, blockchain for assets didn't necessarily need to be a currency, didn't necessarily need to even be a token. It just needed to be happening in the background. And I think, I think we're finally starting to flip the script with some of the stuff BlackRock's doing and JPM's doing where their JPM token's running in the background. You're not investing in the JPM token it is just a constant stream of liquidity. Right, that's an interesting perspective. And I think that that transitions well into some of the, the interesting developments in the blockchain space. So, you know, throughout my journey, we've seen a lot of these hardworking broker dealers, hardworking exchanges that are spending their time acquiring the right licensure, acquiring the right permissions to be able to participate in this space. They then find their clients that are interested in working with new technology and embracing you know, the uncertainty of the security token world, and then have been found that they haven't been able to access this broader economy in a way that is sufficient for their clients' expectations as well as their own. And of course, for a lot of these licensed platforms, whether you're a, on the primary side, meaning you're on that initial fundraise point, or if you're on the secondary side, you're making money on the actual transaction happening. You need capital to come into these companies. You need capital to come into your exchange in order to swap these things to, to build this healthy ecosystem. And so there does seem to be, I think, a, a fine balance between those financial institutions institutions that hold up the compliance side, as well as having some of these third-party technical providers to add a lot of value. That's where Paxson really fits in. Yeah, and I, th I think that's the exciting thing about what we're building. And, and I mean, stepping away from venture to go into launching another layer one is not something I think most people get excited about doing. And, and the reason for that is pretty simple. When we look at the solutions in the marketplace today, there's very little that is all-encompassing. AML is one of the biggest problems in just banking in general. Yet, we have Bitcoin, Ethereum, Solana, Hedera, you know, money moving around without knowing who even controls that money, without knowing where it came from. It's frankly a, a huge problem in this space because if you don't know where the money's been for the last five years in an international environment, it can't be taken by most institutions around the world. If you look at you know, the KYC, the decentralized identity kind of crisis that we've been in, it's very similar too. How do we know who ultimately is the actor? How do we know that we have the ability to have a mutable blockchain in the sense that we can reverse a transaction if you accidentally type six instead of seven? All of these things have been things that have really prevented large-scale adoption and have prevented what is the biggest liquidity provider in the world, which is institutions. And Ryan, you're, you're kind of my technical expert here. Could you also talk about the, the future of, of quantum resistance and what that means for, for banking institutions? This is something that I don't know about anyone else in the crowd. You obviously hear this buzzword of, of quantum computing, but the impacts of it, I think for me at least, have been a little bit less clear of what that actually means and why we need to be building the solutions today to prevent things in the future from happening catastrophically. Could you kind of talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so I'll give a quick context for the people in the crowd that may not be super familiar, because quantum gets thrown around in all sorts of verbiage and everything like that. 
Over the last 21 years, we've still followed Moore's law. It's the idea that computer processing is going to double every seven years or so. What that means, though, to the blockchains we're building is currently Bitcoin would be hacked in about three and a half years with about $780 billion of investment into processing power. Clearly, that's not an option today. Photon computing, however, accelerates Moore's law by almost 120 years. It would make it where we could hack Bitcoin tomorrow. If we go to quantum, the entire global ecosystem of finances will completely fail. It, it is a How speed we, 10 times faster than Photon. Okay, so, so that's certainly a scary future that I don't think any of us want to build for. So, so how do we even build a technology that accounts for that? How do we yeah. solve those problems today? So, so there's a couple things here. The first is quantum hash resistance. It's a buzzword that's going to become very, very popular here in the next 12 to 18 months. Uh, I can go in the deep, deep, deep weeds there, but that's not really the point. What it is, though, is it's an algorithmic, more or less calculus-based future prediction occurring on each block in real time, encrypting the block, but also making it where there's a plug-in key, so there can't be an outside attack on this. Ethereum has spent a lot of time moving towards this, but other assets in the space are woefully far behind or relying on ZK, zero knowledge roll-ups. Uh, that pose significant risks. The other side of this, though, is if we're in a decentralized chain with no centralized actor, the moment quantum computing happens, we're going to have to have a whole decentralized ecosystem bridge over. And that's something that when you talk to banks and their risk departments, they're very scared about. They don't necessarily know if Bitcoin will be able to merge over because it's going to require consensus amongst every validator in the space. Uh, and so that's something that I think when we talk institutional adoption, there needs to be a centralized source that can handle hacks, technological advancements, and also adapt rapidly to an ever-changing envi global environment. Yeah, I think it's, a, it's an interesting point. People ask me all the time my perspective on decentralized versus centralized, as if they are, are kind of binary options. And I, I do think the reality is probably somewhere in between. There are a lot, there's a lot of value in building automated solutions that can execute in a you know, semi-permissioned style of way, where if we know who you are, you, you are able to identify yourself at the entrance of the ecosystem, you can then transact and interact in this ecosystem the way that you want. But as we've seen with different countries and different applications and certainly different asset classes, is that each type of asset or investor has different rules based off of where they're from or who their bank is. And we do need to have some level of, of rule following and rule enforcement in order to allow everyone around the world to interact in a seamless way. So I do think that it doesn't have to be either or. It can be one sometimes and another sometimes depending on the circumstance. I, I, would, I would tend to agree. I think we've had, we've had a lot of great conversations over the years on this, but the, the ultimate debate in crypto is always decentralization at all costs, to the point where we want to have token governance models where there is no principal person in charge. And I think we can look through history and say when there's no one in charge, things usually go wrong. There has to be some guiding mechanism, person, et cetera, to adapt to real world problems. That being said is decentralization from a security perspective, decentralization from a protect the individual perspective, decentralization from the ability to create less hackable networks. There, there's a lot of pros there. It doesn't mean you need to be 100% one way or the other. I think that's something that, as we've been building, we've taken a really close look at, at what elements should be centralized and what elements should be decentralized to guard you know, even corrupt action by our, our own individuals inside the company. I think that's, that's all smart. And We've got you know, just a little bit of time left here. Really appreciate everybody hanging in there. We know it's been an amazing conference, but of course, this stuff is, is very dense from a material perspective. So, um, so everybody that's still here, everybody that's watching, really appreciate you being here. And, and please support eDaily and Flip and everybody for participating. But, but to kind of kick off our, our final chapter here, Ryan, certainly everybody in the security token space has a common problem right now. And it's one that doesn't necessarily have an answer, but just want to start to, to engage the conversation. How do we start building towards a more liquid market in this space? Do you have any thoughts there? I certainly have some of my own. Yeah, so I think my first and foremost is we need to remove fragmentation. The idea that everyone needs to launch on their own token environment and their own token ecosystem with their own wallets is the death knell of security tokens, of real world assets, of everything like that. I think there's a couple people trying to solve this, but individually right now, 
the best people solving it are the individual brokers that are still going out there and raising individually for project after project. There's no centralized liquidity pool. There's no centralized lending platform. We have a couple getting close to kind of, I think, critical adoption where we could start to say that they're major players. But we're not there yet. And I, th I think we also don't have a chain that everyone in this room can categorically go and say, yeah, that's the leader. We probably don't even have two chains that we could say, yeah, this is the best solution in the space. And I think that's the problem is that when we're all sitting here with our individual preferences, we're all running in different directions, trying to push the, push the boat forward, but none of us are running in the same one. I think that's a really strong point. And I, I echo that sentiment. I think that, that building solutions and building technology that we can all support is crucial, but it's so hard to do, especially when, as to your point, in the, I mean this in the best way, a lot of our, our broker dealer and licensed partners have, have driven us to this point, which is great. The problem is that they are a little bit competitive with each other. So there is some level of like, ah, do I really wanna share all of my data with this person or, or this person? And so that's where you know, I hope that, you know, certainly with, with, that's where with security token market, we really felt like we fit in was being that, that third party that was, was not trying to directly compete with these people and these different companies everywhere around the world, just trying to provide provide some of that central source of data. And I think that with Paxum, we're trying to do something similar. How can we bring all of these brokers together from a co-syndication perspective, offering some of those post-issuance services and bringing some of that standardization and consistency to the industry in a user-friendly, easy way, you know, so that we can all kind of try to align some of the technological and take some of that burden off of the individuals that are already you know, taking on so much already. It, it, it hopefully will free up everyone to be more productive. Uh, absolutely, and I, I think, and I'm very curious your thoughts here, and I'll make sure to ask is, is you know, how this has evolved over the last five years. But one thing I've really noticed is right now the brokers, which if you go to any other industry, the brokers are the least technical people in the world. They know the money, they know the asset, and they know the regulatory. They stick to what they're good at. Right. They, they don't have to worry about the tech. And in this industry, when you go and talk to any of the brokers, they are all experts in their individualized tech stack they're using because there is no tech stack that's made for them today. And so that's something I think is like super important as we continue to go forward is looking towards aggregating and creating almost a golden standard of tech stacks that we can start to use in this space and really be able to amplify that. Now, my question for you is with, you know, being in this space six, seven years, having done security tokens from 2017 on, what do you see as like the biggest changes that have occurred and still where is there the missing gap? Yeah, well, I, I certainly think that one of the really interesting products that has been really successful in crypto and I, you know, I've seen other people say this, I'm not gonna coin the term, but the killer use case of crypto, I think was stable coins. I believe Nick Carter said that on stage. I think many other people have also said that. I really believe it's true. I think that, that using the crypto technology, but securing it to a fiat, has, has really shown the benefit of the, the currency side of that application. I think it's very interesting that in security tokens, one of the biggest use cases that we've seen that has been really explosive in its growth and adoption has been money market funds. It's been the same thing. It has been fiat denominated securities. And certainly the US dollar has been the leader in this space today. I see that expanding to other fiat markets as well because the Forex markets are the most liquid in the world. They are the closest in M1 to each other from an economic perspective. And so I think that that really does show that that's how we can continue to build liquidity, bringing dollars and bringing fiat onto the digital economy then creating solutions to get yield on those fiat that you now have in your digital economy. And then now you can create more competitive products to provide more and more yield. And that's what an investor is going to be prioritizing. When you look at an investor in the traditional market, they're prioritizing what is my IRR? What is my yield going to be on this investment over the long term? Even for venture capital, they're still trying to prioritize what their return expectations are going to be at the duration of their fund. And so everything that we need to be doing in the security space is focusing on creating yield bearing opportunities. The great thing about the security token space is that unlike in crypto, we are doing it in a compliant way. We're doing it in a regulated manner. And I think that that has been the interesting part for me in watching this industry grow is that for so long it was a very fragmented 
very retail style of crowd, and then all of a sudden there are more institutional grade products, and what happens? Fidelity launches a money market fund. Obviously BlackRock is in in a huge way. You've got many other additional larger institutions that are now getting involved in these money market funds, which are an interesting way to capitalize on digital assets, and I think that that, that is where we're going to continue to see the adoption is focusing on those products and then creating more and more opportunities to increase that yield slowly but surely using other products like real estate or like private credit or other things like that and seeing that space grow from there. Yeah, and I, I would echo that sentiment. I mean, there's a really common thing in banking, right? Once one bank does something, everyone else follows. And that's the cool thing here is we're seeing, we're seeing this in real time. With the work we're doing, we're talking to almost 20 different countries, like main national bank, and every country is doing something a little different. But the beautiful thing is once we say to one, this one country is doing this, all of a sudden every other country wants to do the same. And so that's where I get really excited here is that we're finally at kind of this tipping point of where these banks are willing to try things out, where governments are actually coming and talking to us and, and asking, you know, how do we set better regulation, legislation, et cetera. And also a lot of court cases have played out. We have a little bit more clarity. Um, I know we're getting towards our end of time here and just want to thank everybody uh, for one, hanging with us at the very end of the day, but also for... Kyle for uh, just all of his hard work here and Flip for organizing the conference. It's and been amazing. Ideally. EDL has been an amazing team, and, and the whole production staff, I mean, they have run a really, really well-timed event that's, that's everybody's been working really, really hard from the staff in the back even to, to flip here front and center. Really appreciate everybody for hosting us. We're from Miami, Florida. So we're from the other side of the world, and we couldn't have felt more welcome here in, in Seoul, South Korea. So thank you to everybody. Really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much for the discussion.